Hi, I'm Max Walker-Williams, and this is a video about Ripple. What you might not know about Ripple and why XRP, the native currency of Ripple, could go to $100 per coin. This is a two-part series. In the first part, I look at the things that you might not know about Ripple and why it could do very, very well indeed and go to $100. And then the second part is what you might not know about Ripple and why XRP could go to zero. So if you're not a massive fan of Ripple, you're going to find this one particularly interesting because presumably you know what you're talking about and you already know everything there is to know on the negative side of Ripple. And if you're a massive fan of Ripple, then the other video is going to be equally interesting because there are things that you might not know that you should know when considering to invest. Okay, so let's jump straight into Oh, before I jump straight into it, I just want to say a massive uh, shout out to NFTLC. I was in London only yesterday having a look again with the venue and just finalizing things. If you are in the UK, in Europe, America, anywhere in the world, and you're willing to travel, come to London, September. Go to www.nft lc.co.uk. I'll put a link in the description below. It's the it's Europe's largest and in my opinion best NFT cryptocurrency and cryptographic technology meetup in Europe. I can't wait to see you there. I'm going to be there. We've got loads of great sponsors: Hedera Hashgraph, HBar, Swirls, you know, VV, uh, um, um, OMI. Ellie Powell, Descent, and on and on and on. We've got some fantastic speakers. And James Joseph of Cyber Magazine himself is going to be the MC and taking care of us all and interviewing people on stage. So it's going to be an absolutely epic day. It's going to be very, very cool. Go to the website, nftlc.co.uk. Have a look and check it out for yourself. Tickets are going on sale soon. There aren't many, and they will sell out quick, genuinely. So if you don't want to be disappointed. Um, and my ethos has always been and always will be, I, I don't like charging what I can, I charge what I think is fair. So I, some of these expos that I go to myself are six, seven, eight hundred, a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars. No, 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 this is going to be, you know, 50 pounds, 100 pounds tops, depending on the kind of ticket you have. And of course, if you have a Walker and Williams NFT partnership program, uh, then you get free entry into NFT LC anyway. Okay, so enough of that. Go over there when you get a minute. I promise you it really is worth having a look. It's a great, it's going to be a great, great day. Free drink, food, um, entertainment. It's going to be good. Anyway, okay, so Ripple, what do we know? Founded in 2012 by Chris Larson and Jeb McLeb to build upon Ryan um, Fuggers, Fuggers? Fugers? I'm going to say Fugers. Fuggers? Fugers. Uh, idea of a decentralized real-time settlement system. Think banking. So when these guys entered the space, they weren't doing it as a joke like Doge. They weren't doing it um, you know, with, with NFTs or smart contracts or being a layer one in mind. These guys were thinking, how do we make the world's money transact smoother, quicker, cheaper? Investors in the project include uh, Google Ventures, SB1 Group, CME Ventures, and Anderson Horowitz. Now, these are some pretty massive names. I'm not going to bore you with them. I will put their links to their websites in the description below. I'm not going to go through each one, but these are massive, massive uh, financial houses, investors, banks, and financial houses. And there are many more, by the way. So these are kind of the, the top line guys. By 2019, more than 300 financial institutions joined RippleNet, and Ripple at this point employs more than 534 people. So RippleNet is the software, it's how the banks actually and the financial institutions transact. It's the software that they use, it's the platform if you like, it's called RippleNet. Um, and in, what is that, nine short years, no sorry, seven short years uh, even, 300, they've gone from a standing start to 300 financial institutions joining RippleNet. Obviously, some will just joined it, haven't have, presumably have never used it, and some will be using it quite a bit. So there'll be a mix of, of use. I wouldn't, I would be very surprised if all 300 are using it um, exclusively, but nevertheless, 300 financial institutions in the world joined RippleNet. And they've got 534 people working for them. I mean, for a tech company, that's like, mind-blowing, that's a lot of people. I mean, it's a lot of people for any business, but in the tech industry, you know, WhatsApp, when it was bought by um, um, Facebook uh, by, for, you know, two billion or whatever it was, they had 12 employees. So kind of, for, so for a tech uh, uh, platform, massive. By 2020, Ripple has three platforms, XCurrent to process payments, pretty straightforward, 
uh, X Rapid to source liquidity and X Via to send payments. So the, basically with the X Rapid, that is for um, more for financial institutions to send money to each other, not your um, uh, your uh, um, uh, retail investor, your retail user. So it's not the end customer like you and I. That uh, X Rapid is to source liquidity, to, to, to call and send money very, very quickly between the financial institutions, between the banks. And Xvia is more for, it's banks too, but more for larger businesses and particularly in developing countries. So they've got three different platforms that serve three different purposes. Relationships have stood the test of time. So this is a really interesting point because there are some projects that you might really, really believe in. I really believe in Hedera Hashgraph, but it is undeniable that it hasn't stood the test of time that Ripple has just by the simple mathematics that Ripple's been around for a lot longer, had many more customers for longer. And it'd be really interesting to see, and maybe this is a separate video again, to see how many of the customers have remained and how many of the customers have either never used the technology because presumably they find a better solution somewhere else, or they've fallen away and left the platform altogether. And maybe I bring that up in the next video. So, uh, but sure enough, relationships have stood the test of time. Uh, FIDA, which is one of Germany's uh, biggest uh, banks, online banks, um, they uh, have been with Ripple's, uh, they've been one of Ripple's customers since 2014, and they were the first institutional customer or partner, whatever you want to call them, of Ripple. So these guys started in two, 2012, two years later, these guys joined, and they're still on the network. So that's, that speaks volumes to me, because customer loyalty, there are two really good ways to judge any business, uh, whether it be crypto or selling socks, it's what is the, as a percentage, repeat customer? because that tells you that people obviously like the service. Now, it doesn't always mean that they like the service. Sometimes they have to have it. Drug dealers will tell you that their repeat business is through the roof, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the product they're selling is good or that you should uh, be a customer. So, um, yeah, so, but it's a good indicator in the normal world that uh, repeat business means, uh, re returning customers means uh, that it's usually a good thing. Uh, and customers that stay for a long, long period of time. So they never leave at all. A software provider, you know, for TV or for Sky or, or whatever it may be, your internet provider, if you never leave them, presumably uh, that's in small part at least uh, because they provide you with a good service at a fair price. Um, okay, so customers of, of Ripple, of RippleNet today include Google, American Express, MoneyGram, Santander, SBI. In 2018, Santander launched PayFX, which runs on RippleNet. It allows retail customers through an app application on your phone, Android, Apple, whatever, an app, and they can send money to and from Brazil, the UK, Poland, and Spain. So that's really, really interesting. So it's, it's not that, because this is the other thing as well when comparing uh, Ripple to other cryptos, is that not only has it stood the test of time, or certainly um, presents to have stood the test of time, in that it's still here, in that it has these customers that it's retained for so long, um, not just that, but also that um, there's actual real use cases happening on the platform right now, and that have been for some time. They've got some pretty impressive customers, and again, just saying Google is a customer doesn't actually tell you, you know, have they come in once and bought a toothbrush and you've never seen them again at an airport, or are they coming in every Friday and doing their weekly big shop? So there's a big, big difference. When somebody says they're your customer or you're their customer, you know, that, that, that's a, a, there's a whole plethora of different types of relationships. And it doesn't mean just because they're a customer yesterday that they're still a customer today. But as of today, right now, um, Google, American Express, MoneyGram. So these are really, really big names. Santander, who've always been very, very forward thinking with technology in general, and specifically cryptographic technology. Santander is a seriously forward thinking bank. Uh, so PayFX, it's an app on your phone. You can download it and it allows you to send money with a couple of taps of a button uh, between these countries seamlessly and practically for free. As good as it makes no difference, for free. So it's absolutely revolutionary and is happening right now in the real world, which is brilliant. And then if you've never heard of SBI, SBI Remit allows uh, Thai nationals living in Japan to send money home before it was cash only through agents. So very specific use case, but SBI Remit, basically they're, they're a financial institution that facilitate payments or transfers of value from one person to another person. Specifically in this use case uh, with uh, RippleNet, 
uh, SBI remit allows, as it says, Thai nationals. So Thai uh, men and women who are working and living in Japan, of which there are many, they really, really struggle to send the money home. A lot of some horror stories of them having all their money stolen off them. And it had to all through previously had to be cash and you had to give the cash to an agent. And I use uh, air quotes for agents because some of them were, you know, uh, shysters and, 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 and con men. And then fingers crossed for massive fees, they would send some money home. Now that's all gone away. It's again, practically for free, instantaneous. You have an app in, in, in um, Japan, your family has an app at home, you send them the money and it's almost instantaneous. Fantastic. So you've obviously heard of American Express, I assume, but what are American Express doing? So American Express are using Ripple uh, Net to facilitate their corporate customers sending their money to their UK accounts. They actually do this in partnership with Santander, I believe. Uh, and there was a really interesting article. I, I suggest you look for it. If I can find it, I'll put a link to it in the description below. Uh, there was a big article in, the, uh, in Fortune magazine about exactly this. American Express had partnered up with the forward thinkers at Santander in order to allow their corporate customers at American Express to send money back to their own accounts in the UK. Again, instantaneously and practically for free. Ripple is called, I don't know if you know this by the way, but this is why Ripple is called Ripple. Ripple is called Ripple because of the way the network operates. If two gateways trust each other, they will deal with each other directly. If not, the protocol will find a path of trust. My mate's mate is my mate. So my friend's friend is my friend. Um, so, and, and that's kind of the concept of it. And I'll explain it in a second in a way that's easy to understand, I hope. So, so transactions ripple through the network. If no path of trust can be found, you can convert value to XRP and transfer via the network itself. Okay, so what's that mean? So the reason Ripple is called Ripple is because it's the way the information or value gets from A to B across the network. It likes to go directly, the shortest distance between any two points is of course a straight line. And it likes to go from A to B directly. However, they have these two different um, addresses, if you like, uh, have to trust each other. So I wanna send you a really important letter um, and I'm gonna do this through the post. Except I've never dealt with the house or the property that you live in before. And so I'm nervous to send the letter directly to your address because you live in a, in a block of apartments and somebody else could open the post and intercept the letter and change the information on it and, and give, give you bad information. Um, you know, uh, or, or they could steal the money that I, I put inside these, this letter that I sent to you. So if I don't trust the address that you are at and I can't send the letter directly to you, what's the alternative? I can send it to a friend who lives nearby, who I've sent loads of stuff to in the past, we've known each other years, we've transacted before, I trust them, and I know that if I send that letter to them, they will pass it on to you. And that is kind of how Ripple works. It ripples through the network. And if I don't know anyone who knows you and that I can trust and that you can trust, then I can actually use a courier, I can actually use the network itself and pay in XRP, in, in, uh, I can transfer the, the document, sorry, into XRP, and I can, I can use the actual courier itself. So I can give it to a, a third party who I trust because of the brand, because of the name, because of the time served, like the Royal Mail, like DHL, like FedEx, whatever, I can pay them and they take the letter to your address and ensure that it goes into your hand. So that's kind of how Ripple works, uh, very, very obviously top level, but that's why it's called Ripple. Ripple has a great head start and has established some excellent working relationships. So if anything, if history has ever taught us, if, for example, everyone knows, no secret, I'm a big believer of Hadira Hashgraph. If somebody said to me, and nobody, I don't get asked this very often, which is interesting, but if you said to me, Max, what do you think Hadira Hashgraph's uh, biggest sort of weakness is? What's his vulnerability? I would say that even if you believe, and you may not, but even if you believe or agree that Hadira Hashgraph is superior technology to Ethereum or Cardano or um, Ripple or whichever, it doesn't mean that it would still necessarily win in terms of adoption, mass adoption, because this one over here has got a better logo, it got to market first, and that happens all the time in all different markets. You can go out and buy a fishing rod 
the, the, and, and you buy that one because the man in the shop tells you all about it and it's the one on the beautiful display and blah, 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 because they're, they were first to market, they're better established, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best fishing rod. The one over in the corner is a much, much better fishing rod, but it came to market later. It costs ever so slightly more or perhaps even costs a little bit less, but they, but they haven't got the budget to pay the man in the fishing shop uh, the commission to sell their rod like this guy. He gets 10% if he sells this rod and then 5% if he sells that rod. They haven't got the big flash TV commercials. They don't get to market quick enough and you just get market share quick enough that you become the dominant player and it has nothing to do or very little to do with the quality that you provide in comparison to the two competitors. So they have got a fantastic, and I'm not saying by the way that Ripple isn't good tech because it absolutely is, of course. Um, it's not without its issues and its history and we'll go through that in part two. Um, but it is, it is, there's no denying it's solid tech. Um, but I just think, yeah, they've got a great advantage in that they were, they got to market so early and that they have so many customers and people using and real use cases and, and a real following at a, at a, um, at a retail, at a level. That's you and I. Could win against the SEC or uh, a favorable settlement. So if you go onto Twitter, if you're on Twitter, I'm on Twitter at M Walker Williams, just uh, link below. If you go onto Twitter and you follow the XRP uh, people, uh, the Ripple fans, um, I have never met a group of people that are that intense and passionate about a project uh, than, the, than the Ripple lot. If you go on there and you say something uh, derogatory about Ripple, be warned. Like Netflix has taught us, don't mess with cats on the internet and well, don't mess with Ripple either because those guys will rip you apart, tear you a new one. So I'm saying it could win. They're saying, oh, well, of course it'll win. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a farce, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's be real for a second. The SEC is not, despite what you may think, despite what the echo chamber say on Twitter, they're not in the business of going after uh, projects, people, uh, businesses that haven't done anything wrong. You know, they're not just grabbing people off the street and sending them to Guantanamo Bay. It doesn't happen. A lot of people, a lot of these people who speak so passionately about Ripple don't even know that Ripple's been fined previously, found guilty, didn't contest, and paid a $700,000 fine. So this isn't actually the first time uh, Ripple's sort of been in this situation. Again, not a bad judgment again. Ripple, if you're at the cutting edge of technology and you're, you're, you're um, in a new world of, of pushing boundaries, of course, sometimes, unfortunately, you might get caught out. But they could uh, settle favorably. Uh, it could go away. They could win, if you like, against the SEC. Who knows? No one can predict the outcome of the court case. No one. Um, and, and that obviously will do major things uh, for the price. Market cap is not value. I have had to draw two red arrows to this and underline it three times. I, am, I still meet tens, if not hundreds of people every single day who tell me Hedera Hashgraph cannot go to $1.00 or $5 or $10 or $100 or 10 cents or whatever it is their, their opinion is because there are 50 billion coins in existence. Market cap, which is how many of something there are times how much the last one sold for, and value, i.e. what each one of those things is actually worth, are not the same thing. I'm not gonna bore you with it here. If you're interested in market cap versus value, I've already made a video exclusively about that subject and demonstrating exactly once and for all why market cap and value are not the same thing. If you wanna see that video, just click the link in the description below. But to put it very, very simply, if you disagree with me and you think that market cap and value are the same thing, I've got a fantastic deal for you. I have just created a new uh, cryptocurrency. It's called Market Cap and Value are not the same thing. It's not a very catchy name, but it's a fantastic project with a great logo. And I've minted 10 million coins. I sold one uh, to Billy for my friend to, for one pound, which makes my, all of the coins in my uh, project worth one pound. And it makes me worth 10 million pounds and it makes the project worth 10 million pounds. I am gonna sell my project to you if you disagree that market cap and value are the same thing for 1,000 pounds. So you send me 1,000 pounds, comment below, we'll, we'll, we'll meet up online, I'll give you my details. You send me 1,000 pounds in Bitcoin, crypto, fiat, whatever, stamps, gold, silver, whatever, jewelry, I'll take anything. Uh, you give me 1,000 pounds and I will give you, in your own opinion, 10 million pounds worth of cryptocurrency, my own project, for your 1,000 pounds. What a bargain. 
because I sold one for one pound, there's 10 million of them, so they must all be worth one pound, and therefore I have 9,999,000 coins left to sell you. Market cap and value are not the same thing. Why is this important? This is important for Ripple because Ripple has 100 billion coins. Now, if people say, well, you know, a lot of people say online, Ripple's going to go to $100. It's a guaranteed, they're going to beat the SEC, and then we're going to move on to great and wonderful things. It's going to be the standard of world commerce and money, and that's all fantastic. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and, and as a result, we're going to go to $100. But 100 times 10 billion is 10 trillion. And that, I mean, just go and Google it yourself, 10 trillion is the market cap of a lot of stuff. So, uh, and people say it was impossible. Well, rest assured, Ripillions, or whatever it is uh, you guys call yourselves, the XRP army, which is not very catchy, but it is what it is, um, you rest assured that market cap and value are not the same thing. So that is important. If your argument that Ripple cannot go to $100 is because there are 100 billion coins and therefore 10 trillion um, um, uh, mar market cap is, is not possible or not realistic, I have to say I disagree on that point and I've made a complete video explaining why. I hope you found this video informative. I wanted to keep it quite short. I wanted to tell you a few little bits of information that you might not know about Ripple and give you my case of why I think Ripple could go to $100.